Hello, and welcome to my talk, Language Documentation in the Tanzanian Rift Between Knowledge Construction and Language Work. So we will start our talk today with a drive uh, into Babati from uh, the direction of the Singida Road. Uh, and I'll give uh, a short rundown of what I'll be talking about today. So while uh, African languages on average are less documented and less described than the rest of the world, the languages of the Tanzanian Rift possess a level of description that is higher than most other areas on the African continent. This is a result of a confluence of activity, including that of individuals associated with colonization, with faith-based work and with academic institutions, as well as native informants, in quotation marks, language consultants, and helpers, the number of whom is unknowable, but whose contributions were the sine qua non of all the descriptive works. In a contemporary context, in which the documentation and description of minority languages is a central desideratum for both linguistics and humanity at large, the process of how the diverse languages of the Tanzanian Rift came to be described to the, that degree is invaluable. This talk is an initial attempt at understanding this process and focuses on this final group of actors, uh, the local contributors to language documentation and description, because it is these actors whose voices are often silent. Specifically, this talk will center the experiences of four Gorwa speakers, local researchers who, as part of the research on the Gorwa language, have been involved in this kind of documentary and descriptive work for almost a decade. Following a brief section in which I establish some of the wider context in which this talk occurs, I'll then talk about the Gorwa local researchers, first describing the work they did, next identifying the unique character of the contributions that they made to the documentation, and then talking about how they view the work of language documentation and description. I'll then conclude. Uh, before everything, I'd like to say that a recording of this talk will be ma made available shortly after its live presentation, both on Zenodo at the DOI given, as well as on YouTube via the QR code on screen. To start, I'd like to provide a bit of information on who I am. So this is a photo from back in 2018 of myself and the four Gorwa local researchers who will form the basis of this talk. I expect we'll get to know the local researchers a bit more throughout the course of the talk. And as for myself, I'm a linguist interested in the languages of the Tanzanian Rift, their documentation and description, their morphosyntax, and the histories and cultures of their speaker communities, especially as evinced through linguistic arts and language contact. I've been conducting language documentation in this part of Tanzania since around 2012, and the speaker communities with which I prim primarily work are Gorwa, Ihanzu, and Hadza. Descriptive linguistics is primarily concerned with providing structural accounts of the features and rules of a given language based on empirical analysis. Outputs typically take the form of word lists, articles on grammatical features, brief grammatical sketches, and toward the more extensive end of things, dictionaries and grammars. Through his extensive work with the Glottolog project, my colleague Harold Hammerstrom has created some very interesting heuristics to measure how well a language is documented. And in this case, he charts the progression of language documentation over time. The talk linked above lays out a detailed methodology, but suffice it to say that in this visual, each point represents a language, and the higher a number a language receives, the better described that language is said to be. In this way, we can see the progress of descriptive linguistics across the world over the past 300 years. Further, in the same talk, these individual language scores of one to five 
are then taken to produce an average documentation number. That is, divide the total number of languages in a geographic region by the total number of points these languages received in terms of the description, and it provides a rough average of how well the languages of a given geographical area have been described. Now, the shortcomings of this method are clear, but again, as a heuristic, it serves as a nice starting point. We can see here that the languages of North America are on average the most described, followed by the languages of Eurasia, followed by South America and Australia, with the African continent next to last in terms of exhaustiveness of description, with an average documentation value of 2.87. For the purpose of our talk, what is relevant here is that when one performs the same operation for the languages of the Tanzanian Rift Valley, the average documentation value is 3.375, meaning that on average, the languages of this area are considerably better described than most other parts of the African continent and indeed most other parts of the world. So why is that the case? Well, myself and others, including my colleague Martin Mouse, would submit that this is the result of a confluence of activity, including that of individuals associated with colonization, such as this uh, grammar of uh, Nyilamba uh, by Johnson, 1923, uh, people involved with faith-based work, uh, as is represented by Olson, 1964, and Eaton, 2008, um, and uh, individuals associated with academic institutions, uh, such as uh, this work, uh, Mouse, uh, 1993, Kiesling, 1994, and Griscom, 2019. And uh, these works themselves were in correspondence with the work of others, Olson's work resting on the shoulders of Meinhof, 1906, for example, and Richard Griscom's work in conversation with that of Franz Rotland, uh, 1983, as it so happens, whose office I now occupy here at the University of Bayreuth. The individuals working on the languages of the Tanzanian Rift might also be described as prolific in the art of working together. Kiesling and Maus collaborated on many works, including the landmark 2003 lexical reconstruction of West Rift Cushitic, for example. The figures mentioned above, virtually all of whom came from other language and cultural traditions outside of the rift, uh, outsider researchers, to borrow a term from Emeka 2006, are often the ones we speak of when we talk about language documentation and description. But along with these outsider researchers are always the insider researchers, those people from the language communities under study, uh, answering questions providing grammaticality judgments, and contributing their voices to these larger projects. It should be noted that in my appellation, along with African languages, is the additional element and the construction of knowledge. Here, we have an image of Ihanzu people constructing a house. Notice how many people there are. There is virtually no distinction between what is going on in this image and the project of language documentation and description in which people have been engaged in the Tanzanian Rift Valley. One is the construction of a house, of a form of inhabiting the world, and one is the construction of things like grammars and language documentations, the construction of a way of understanding the world. And so, out of the various kinds of people listed above, I've chosen today to focus on the local researchers. It is my hope that this will at once provide a view on participants in the construction of knowledge who are often not acknowledged as such, as well as point to ways in which African language knowledge construction may proceed in the future. The case study which I will take up today is that of the four Gorwa local researchers who were involved in language documentation and description, which I have convened and been involved with since 2012. This case is an easy choice for me as I am intimately familiar with how the work developed and the role of each local researcher. I'll draw on both the measurable outcomes of the documentation project as well as from interviews which were conducted with each of these local researchers, uh, which occurred toward the end of their active data collection process.
Of note for this audience, Gorwa is not related to Swahili, that is, it is a Cushitic language and not a Bantu language. It has around 133,000 speakers, and its usage is certainly declining as its speakers switch to using the national lingua franca Swahili. In my experience, language attitudes are characterized by a divide in both age and whether speakers live in urban areas or more rural locations, with the language seen as more relevant and valuable among the old and those living in rural areas. Having introduced some important contexts, I would like to now move our, our discussion to uh, the Gorwa local researchers themselves, so specifically providing a narrative of some of what they did. In many ways, this story can be told in the data they collected, uh, all of which is archived digitally with the Endangered Languages Archive. There are different types of recording included, but for our purposes today, the most important is the type coded here in blue, the natural speech recordings. These are the largest type of recording and also both linguistically and culturally the most rich. Broken down by minutes recorded per month since the start of the project, the data looks like this, representing various waves and times of data collection. The part of that story which uh, we will look at today starts in 2018, at which time the Gorwa insider researchers began making recordings independently of uh, myself, the outsider researcher. A first aspect of their work that was uh, during their work, they set out to comprehensively cover their language community, including as many places as possible. <laughs> Kaenda Sangara, kaenda enda Begi, kaenda Ayasanda, moja na enda Gwiri. Sehemu za Gidas, sehemu za Mamire, Gedamara, Babati, lakini pia Bagara, Yakil pia nimezungukia. Imefika sehemu ya Ayatlaa, imefika Nakwa. Taking all the data they collected into account, there are very few communities which were not included in their work. Uh, in addition to an extensive coverage of the physical geography of the community, the insider Gorwa researchers also attempted to cover a kind of social geography of the speech community as well. They worked with over 150 people, ranging from young people in their early 30s to elders in their 70s and beyond. This network diagram, designed by my colleague Richard Griscom, shows each individual as a node, with the lines between nodes indicating an interaction throughout the course of the project. Thicker lines represent more interactions. And we can see the four local Gorwa researchers as hubs uh, with um, people sort of surrounding them. Another measure of the work the Gorwa local researchers did is size. Uh, measured in minutes, the entire archived collection now contains approximately 550 hours of recorded materials. And indeed, compared to many similar collections, the archive deposit is considerably large. The work also features aspects which are better examined in a qualitative manner, which is what we will now do. One aspect has to do with the degree of interactivity which results when an insider researcher makes recordings versus interactivity when an outsider researcher makes recordings. Knowledge of the language is one thing, but another is the ability of local researchers to engage with speakers according to their own levels of familiarity uh, with engaging in research. Uh, Pascal Bu'u gives one example here. Yaani kabla ya siku yenyewe nishafika kwa huyu mtu ili kwamba ni mwandae kwa sababu naweza kwaenda kwa mtu kwa yake akishaona kamera na kina sa sauti anakuwa ni mwoga mwoga kama vile anaogopa au nafanya labda ni serikali wamekuagiza mimi naenda naenda kwake na muoneshe laptop na muoneshe kina sa sauti kwamba hii ni kamera hii itakuwa inachukua sauti hii itakuwa inachukua video alafu pia naenda na baadhi ya picha ambazo yani kazi ambazo nilifanya kabla na watu wengine ambao yeye anafahamu ya maeneo ambayo yako karibu mm. na yeye hasa pale ndipo mtu anapata amani anakuwa na amani na anapofanya kazi na wewe 
The topics which were recorded by local researchers was also wide. And distinct from individual topics, local researchers also managed to record some genres seemingly unique to the Gorwa language community. Take, for example, the genre of speech that occurs during the Gorwa betrothal ceremony in which the woman engages in a ritual act of trying to take the shoes off of her soon-to-be husband while he is expected to resist. The onlookers are expected to insult the vigor of the bride-to-be, and thus this set of ritual insults represents an entire genre of speech hitherto undocumented. A final aspect I would like to touch on is less that of how the local researchers uh, did the work, but more about how the Gorba local researchers perceived the work. This quote from Stefano Edward does a good job of summarizing how the local researchers viewed the work, well-compensated cultural labor, which allowed them to build ties with people and learn more about their own community. But just as universal was the feeling that more needs to be done to connect the research to the local community, especially on the side of the outsider researcher, that's me. Uh, work to close feedback loops in communication and accountability. Matokeo bado. Jamii bado hawajaanza kuitumia matokeo ya utafiti wangu. Jamii kwa sasa bado haijajua matokeo ya utafiti wangu kwa sababu bado sijafanya mrejesho. Furthermore, local researchers were not vague in how they imagined this reconnection of the research with the community to be. Stefano summarizes well in this quote. Matokeo ya utafiti huu yaweze kupatikana kwenye jamii. Vijana waone, vide waone, kwenye runinga. Kue na msenta ambayo ni ya luga. Yani hizi tarifa zipatikane. Na pia kutokana na utafiti huu na mabu mengi ya mepatikana kwa hiyo. Another element common to the Gorwa local researchers' conceptualization of the research is that it must be of a continual nature, less of some one-off project and more of a process, like the seasonal hoeing of a field or the daily pounding of maize. This immediately reminded me of the dialogic practice of freedom modeled in Frere 1970, uh, which states, the investigators should call for volunteers among the local people to serve as assistants. These volunteers will gather a series of necessary data about the life of the area. Of even greater importance, however, is the active presence of these volunteers in the investigation. Investigators record the idiom of the people, their expressions, their vocabulary, and their syntax, that is, the way they construct their thought. Rereading this quote, I'm struck by how much what is described here resembles how the Gorwa local researcher's work was carried out. In Freer's model, this is, in fact, just one part of a larger integrated whole. 
uh, and inspires me to imagine what this entire cycle might look like in the Gorwa context. Certainly, the archived materials have a role to play here. As of now, the Gorwa local researchers have transcribed and translated approximately 157 hours of the total, essentially an act of deeply understanding and engaging with the data. Further steps might also be picked out. An interdisciplinary study of the theme of rain, for example, draws on some of the materials brought into focus by the Gorwa researchers. Finally, I return to Stefano's reflections on what the research should look like into the future. Among the things he notes, a couple of elements are familiar, books and dictionaries. These would seem to be within the realm of language documentation and description as traditionally construed. But what is really interesting is these other elements, videos accessible through one's phone, a center dedicated to the language, a place for learning and relearning the language. These outputs seem to move beyond documentation and description and into the realms of active language learning, language development, language planning, and language maintenance and reclamation. All of these elements are, in fact, considered part of the same inclusive set uh, by Wesley Leonard, who proposes a novel type of linguistics rooted in praxis called language work. It would seem to me, then, that in order to create a linguistics that is responsive to the Gorwa community's needs, and quite possibly many more speech communities like the Gorwa people, this is the shift in paradigm that must take place. To conclude, then, the Tanzanian Rift is among the places on the African continent with the richest and most extensive collection of linguistic descriptions. This has been brought about by colonial explorers, faith based projects, and more recently, professional linguists. Common to all of these endeavors has been the centrality of local speaker communities and the labor, often invisible, which they contribute to these projects of knowledge construction. In focusing on four members of the Gorba speech community engaged in language documentation and description, this talk chronicled the work they carried out, identified their contributions, and reflected on how they view language documentation and description. Employing their insider knowledge of the area, the Gorwa local researchers achieved almost comprehensive coverage of the Gorwa speaking area, working with a high number and diversity of Gorwa people building a corpus of literally hundreds of hours of highly interactive recordings on a variety of topics within a number of different speech genres. And though they identified great personal benefits in the work they did, both in learning about their own communities and being paid fairly for the cultural work they did, they universally identified that more needs to be done, especially by the outsider linguist, to provide feedback to the wider speaker community. Finally, the Gorba local researchers universally conceive of their research as work unfinished, a conceptualization that brings to mind the dialogic practices of freedom, discovering the world they live in, and from it charting new, emic ways of learning, researching, and transforming the world. Along with this, their visions of future research, or research break the bounds of language documentation and description as traditionally conceived and necessitate new visions of linguistics oriented less towards the parochial concerns of academic linguistics and more towards the reclamational programs of language work. Before I close, I'd like to acknowledge the bodies which funded the research I talked about today, as well as the Gorwa local researchers, my colleague Richard Griscom, and all the Gorwa people who contributed to this research, especially those who appeared in the course of the presentation. Thank you, and here are my references.